Hello. Just so we don't Good morning. Good morning, Sarah. Thanks so much Hi, for guys. being here. Thank you. And really appreciate it. I you love know. the spotlight. <laughs> it took a little convincing to uh, get you to agree to be here today, but we're very pleased that you did. You know, Sarah, I wanted to ask you firstly, tell us a little bit about your other profession. Tell us a little bit about how you got into that and how you transitioned to real estate. But let's start with your previous, or not your previous, your sort of concurrent profession that you have running. What we're leveraging from and into. Uh, similarly to, uh, I think it was, his name was Steve, and I also know Howard Biederman. I was also in the Schmata business, uh, but working with women. Uh, from the ripe old age of 13, I worked at Over the Rainbow. I was the youngest and probably the top salesperson because I have a photographic memory for inane things such as skews. And I could remember every size range of clothing when they have basketball teams come into town and we're talking 35 years ago, uh, they would say, okay, Sarah, will do it. So I worked there from the ages of 13 to 16. And from there I was scooped up by Joe Mimran at Club Monaco, his flagship store on Queen West. Uh, and again, I did quite well in the corporate sort of uh, boutique environment. And then there was a women's clothing store, which Elise would be familiar with. Uh, it, it was from a different era. Uh, it was called Shea Catherine. And Catherine Hill was the first uh, retailer in Canada to bring Armani and Versace and Valentino in its heyday. And they were looking for someone young and approachable to add to their roster of intimidating uh, mature sales staff. Uh, and I would go there every day with a stomach ache and I would generally uh, perform quite well to the point where uh, I was asked to go on buying trips with Catherine and her then daughter, Stephanie, uh, to New York. Uh, I did Valentino. So I, I learned how to work on the buying end, uh, but my client roster was very high net worth, socialites, senior executive women. And Fast forward to when they were trying to encourage me not to go to university. My parents said, get a BA. We don't care what it's in. So I did an American history, which is completely irrelevant in Montreal. Uh, but every summer I would go back and I would work at Catherine's shop. I would sell $100,000 to $150,000 worth of women's clothing per month. And this is in the 90s. Uh, and the intent was to continue on and buy into the business. I then took a slight hiatus. And some of the women from that boutique would reach out to me and ask me if I could help them shop. So I became a personal shopper stylist where I'd go to people's homes and curate their wardrobes uh, before anybody had a personal shopper, personal stylist, personal staff, chef, personal assistant. And I would turn bright red when people asked me what I did for a living. And that's what I wound up doing. And then in the, I guess I'm dating myself, in the dot-com era, Jake, you probably won't even know what that is. Uh, I was asked by some of the executive women to come and be the fashion police for their companies because they didn't know how to gently tell people, you can't wear a baseball hat on casual Friday if you're working at Goodman's. You can't wear ripped jeans even though it's you know, fashionable, it wasn't corporately appropriate. So then I put together a capsule seminar and I toured MBA programs, law schools, uh, all kinds of finance departments and honed my public speaking skills and helped people put their best face forward, men and women alike. How do I become involved in real estate, you ask? Well, you didn't, but I will just segue <laughs> into there. Uh, the business that I was in, and I'm sure Howard had the same experience, one's body image and how one feels about themselves is really tied into a whole host of other issues. And I'm sure most of us agents I'm not as experienced as most of the people at the, at the brokerage are, uh, but you will know that you become a psychologist. And I don't remember really, I don't care what people are wearing, it's not important, but it's just the image and making people feel good about themselves is where I would get my, my rush. Uh, so then one day, five years ago, I was at a hedge fund client who was a genius, uh, working at Gluskin Chef and looking to open up his own hedge fund. And his business partner said, Sarah, you got to like package him because he can't go to the office in sweatpants, even though he's a genius. So I did up his whole look and his wife and sort of packaged their corporate presence properly. And then one day I was in his house and money was not an object for them at all. 
And I looked at him like, wow, Brad, you need a new house. Like your wife's pregnant with her third kid. You're busting at the seams. And he was like a small town Ontario guy, had no clue where to start. And I had a girlfriend who was a lovely woman who just got her license at Chestnut Park. She was a very meticulous, cerebral woman. And I just did a referral and boom, two weeks later, he bought an $11.5 million house in Rosedale. And then I thought to myself, hmm, the remuneration on selling a sweater versus a house and it's all the same type of, and he asked me to come look at the house several times. So that's when I thought I should get my real estate license just to leverage the personal luxury lifestyle experience. So that's how I'm trying to segue from one to the other without alienating the fashion audience, even though I'm not that interested anymore. Uh, and I would prefer to focus and I'm, you know, getting some traction. Uh, it's, I'm into my, I'm just on year two, almost three, uh, sort of two plus uh, in real estate, but it's been quite a ride so far. You know, it's funny, as you're talking about that, you're talking about MBA. I remember my first day of the MBA, I guess I had three buddies who I was going to school with and I never spoke to them. It, I, it wasn't the type of thing that, you know, you would do is call a friend, what are you wearing tomorrow? So right. it was my first day of business school and I wore uh, a three piece suit with a tie and cufflinks and, you know, a, a briefcase, a leather briefcase that was completely empty. And <laughs> I, it's a prop. And, the, as a prop and I see my three buddies and they're in ones in track pants and a hoodie. The other guy, they go, are you going somewhere from here? I go, no, no, I thought this is the way people dress. Well, I was, you know, completely wrong. Uh, anyway, so bottom line is it's interesting. And I, I don't, I, I think Heim's on this call, but he may remember uh, when Heim came in to Callis, uh, he was with a small company called Snowbirds and he used to come in in a pair of you know ripped jeans cowboy boots sunglasses indoors and elise who you know they became close said to him hi what are you doing with the cowboy boots and the ripped jeans and this he said at least you have to remember who my clients are right. i'm working with bill almost exclusively and you have to know your clientele you have to know your audience 100 percent. right and you know siri one of the things i wanted to talk to you about is you know, you and I bumped into each other um, years ago, uh, probably without mentioning names, I would say in the history of Canada, the greatest philanthropist who has ever lived. And I say yes. that. Yes. And I get shivers. I love her to bits. We know who. Yes. Right. And I'm not going to mention names, but I was there because I'm related uh, to the family and they had a, a, a celebration of life that probably had about 4,000 people yeah. by invitation only. And yeah. then they had a private service at their home. I yes. think there were about 10 people in total. And I, again, I was there because I'm related, a huge admirer of this person. And you were there as a friend of his widow. And something struck me when I saw you there. And you and I go back many years, but something really struck me. It was, you weren't there as a stylist. You I weren't started, there. But I never finished, I know. You were there as a friend. And that's, I think, the magic that you possess. And I, I'm not putting you on the spot, but- No, I get the clamps. About, <laughs> no, no, but there's something about the way you carry yourself and the way you interact with people that you establish, it's not a professional relationship, it's a personal relationship. They come into my heart and I'm, I, I say it in a, a video that I do for uh, this upcoming listing that my clients become my friends. And I just mean that genuinely. Uh, I remember Elise saying in her fireside chat with you that she's relationships are sort of the most key attribute to a successful career. And I'm not doing it to be fake. I just, I start off as the professional advisor on some level. And then I take on maybe more in my heart than I should. So there's the, the yin and the yang of taking things personally and being sensitive, but yeah, my clients and I, I know exactly who you're speaking of, and I was patched into the behind the scenes of what they're wearing for this monumental historic heartbreaking event, but a uh, tribute. And I was in the inner circle and it was, I was very flattered, but it was just, People are people. It doesn't matter how fancy, how wealthy. It's really what's inside that counts. And you can't judge. You really can't judge. But there's still a level of professionalism that you're look one, at least I believe one has to project uh, in 
on this whole pandemic era with Zoom and digital media, uh, I've had a few clients and companies reach out to me on, can you just assist us with our corporate presence online? And I'm just like talking off the cuff. I still think when you go to Starbucks, you know who's wearing the green apron, you know who will serve you the coffee. When you are, whether it's in real estate or whatever, you still have to project a certain uh, sense of authority and you're capable. And I feel that the way you dress, package, cut your hair, not cut your hair, just groom oneself is very important. And it just breeds confidence and instills uh, comfort in your clients trusting you and the brand message you're trying to convey resonates much clearer and more effectively I feel if you're packaged in an appropriate way it's all about branding you're you're on the zoom meeting and you have your Harvey Callis logo in the background we, it's it, it, there's a certain sort of you're the boss not in a uh, intimidating manner but it's just we know who's speaking and I, I find that very important uh, on all your branding, your social media branding, your letterhead, the way your car is tidied and organized, I find it a very important uh, reflection on your professionalism and your credibility. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you say that I'm happy you brought it up and it's hard specifically during these times, you know, to sort of keep it together. Uh, you know, I, when my kids come down, I say, what are you doing wearing a suit? Well. I'm in a meeting. Even though I'm on a computer, I'm in a meeting. 100%. And it's important for you to convey a level of professionalism. You know, one thing that uh, jumps into mind, I was at a conference um, in Chicago last year, and there's a gentleman who runs a company, very, very successful in, in Jupiter, Florida. His first name is Rob. He's actually at Harvey and Elisa's home uh, for, a, for a Toronto conference. And he was he was speaking and one of the things he said was the way you dress. So he used as an example, he said, let me ask you a question. If you're a client thinking about working with an agent and you're at your kid's drop off and the first agent you see has, you know, a pair of track pants on and a ripped t-shirt and a hoodie and jumps out of the car and their hair's completely, you know, out there and they drop their kid off. And then the next realtor pulls up again, dropping their kid and they are in a business suit, professionally appearing. And you're thinking about it, whether we recognize it or not, it has an impact. We it's don't very even realize hundred percent. It's very subconscious. You may have done zero deals, dress as though you've done a thousand already. It's just how you, right. I remember when I'd have an exam and science was not my forte, nor, nor my passion. And I recall, I mean, 10th grade going in sweatpants. And my mother said to me, what are you doing? Go upstairs, take a shower, get dressed. And I put on something with a button and a zipper and I got dressed and I'm like, okay, I, you just, it just, I changed the channel in my brain and how I dressed did, I did okay, but I probably didn't fire worse if I was just slumped in my chair in my sweatpants, not really putting too much effort or thought into it. So I really do think it's, it's vital to one's performance and, you know, just fake it till you make it kind of thing, but not, but in an authentic way, what's comfortable within your wheelhouse and your personality. But to your point of Chaim, who's dressing appropriately for his audience, you do have to, I'm very mindful of that. There's some times when I've been with clients who are like women who are incredibly tall. I am not a heel girl, but those are the days that I'm wearing heels. It's, I just, it just sort of elevates me to make me feel a little more polished. When I'm with men, uh, I 99.9%, .9 I'll make sure I wear a blazer. It just, there's just a certain level of professionalism trying to keep on par with my peers or my clients. Uh, and it's all reflective of that. And you know, people will defer to you in a different way uh, and be turning to you for your advice if you sort of convey and project that image of capability, competence, um, and just polished professionalism. Well, you know, before I get to my next question, it's sort of there's a cute anecdote. I remember, I don't know if there's some Seinfeld um, fans in the crowd, but yes. uh, George had, uh, George Costanza had met Jerry at the, at the uh, coffee shop and he sat down and he was wearing track pants. And, and Jerry looks at George and says, you know, 
George, a man wearing track pants outside <laughs> of the house has just given up. That's uh, yes, the attitude. That's a hundred percent. Totally. Lagerfeld you also know, said something to that effect. It's like you've rolled over and played dead. And I will encourage everybody, even on an internal Zoom meeting, you don't have like people with, you know, Michelle's acutely, she texts me, I better get in my yoga pants. First of all, no one cared from the waist down. I posted on Instagram in the beginning of COVID, a shot of me wearing a blazer with free city sweatpants, just because it's what's up, up top that counts. But even I feel in internal meetings, it's not ideal to be in a bathrobe because even internally, you might choose select an agent in a certain area to partner with but i will subconsciously think oh she's not that into it if you're in your robe and you're just half put together it does right it does resonate and it sometimes is jarring so tell us this so when you made the transition into real estate i remember uh one of your first sales i think was on vesta for Adam, north of five yeah 6.6. It was 6.6 on Vesta. And it was right. the most stressful deal. <laughs> no but terror, I remember, it was a mess. And, but, but I think the reason why I bring that up is because it may have been a stressful situation, but yet you were, a, you were able to navigate through it with some big hitters, agents, developers. I didn't know Adam. It was a Robert Greenberg, Adam Weiner package. I, I, I knew nobody. I knew nothing. Uh, but I know how to sell and I know how to walk in polished professional. I know what a nice home looks like. And I said to you, I can sell. I might, know I might not know real estate. This is years back, but I know how to sell. And right. my mother would say I could sell ice to an Eskimo. And we walked in and the, the client specifically hired me because they knew that I had an eye and I'm, I'm privy to luxury real estate. And at the end of the deal, they said, and I never uttered a word about it. And they said, were we your first sale? And I'm like, Yes. They're like, yes, we wanted to be your first one. And I was like, oh my God, I was so mortified, but they pulled it out of a hat. Well, listen, it's, it's not a bad uh, first transaction to do 6.6, .6, but I think, you know, there's, there's something to be said about working with people. How do you, when you're meeting with a client and you're transitioning from a client who you've met, it could be something from your past life mm -hmm. in retail, how are you able to transition that into, hey, you know, let me help you with your real estate needs? How have you been able to successfully do that? Uh, it's, it's a fine line. Uh, I didn't want to do a dead stop in terms of my social media from fashion direct, directly to real estate because I don't want to be sort of perceived as you're selling a house or you're selling me shoes. Like It's been a bit tricky to maneuver that, particularly when I haven't had my own listings as yet. I've been heavy on the buying end and I'm a little bit sensitive and uncomfortable posting, you know, congratulations all the, cause I, I like to keep my client's privacy protected as well. Uh, I've been trying to sort of slowly parlay when I joined Callis, uh, you and Elise were incredibly gracious with your time and allowing me to sort of uh, announce on a co-branding because I sort of feel uh, as an independent personal stylist where there are many retailers and, and department stores that have their own personal shopping uh, services, I was very cognizant of brand presence and Callus is just the top of the top of the heap. And it's uh, very on par with my Forest Hill, Rosedale, high net worth Yorkville uh, eyes. Uh, so I've been trying to stagger some interior shots, uh, fashion shots. I, I find it still sometimes tricky, but as sort of listings right. are coming in, it's becoming a little bit less, uh, fraudulent in my insecure brain at times. Uh, we have this amazing listing on in King City that again will gain traction. I've got another lease coming out on Belmont uh, in a week or two. We're just doing the photos at the end of the week. So that again, it's the proper appropriate address from the previous life, which isn't to say I don't do things in other parts of the city. Um, but it's been, it's been a tough balance. And I'm just very mindful of what goes out there on social media. And just I, well, people in conversation are like, well, you can sell me this and they trust me enough. They're, they're curious about other people's homes. And I've been so intimately in people's homes, seeing them naked and seeing their closets that it's become a little more evolutionary, natural, naturally. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I think about it. If you look at probably one of the top five agents in Canada, uh, he was a maitre d' at a very fine restaurant. Yes. And I, for a reason, if you can, if he can handle taking care and getting me a table that he can take care of my real estate. Does that equate? Well, in fact, it does. 
because it goes back to what you were saying about relationships. You know, I saw that listing that you and Zach have uh, in, in King City and it's spectacular. I, you know, uh, it, it's exciting and you've been able to transition that. But to me, what I find is, is that it all ties back to what you talked about, about relationships. You know, what, what's that, you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I, and, 100%. And, and the seller, the day, for, yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, please. This, the seller of this home, um, it's not to be, I'm not advertising it, but everybody knows. This home was a Princess Margaret Hospital winning home. And it comes completely turnkey furnished. I'm not looking to promote the property, but the, the sensitivity that I have uh, is the sellers are very small town, unsophisticated, intelligent, but they're not from the King City, Forest Hill, big city slicking world. They're a retired couple from uh, Guelph. And I'm so cognizant and sensitive of taking good care of them. They're very overwhelmed. Uh, they were poached by all kinds of solicitations from Keller Williams and Remax to get this listing because it was so highly publicized from Princess Margaret Hospital. And that's what I'm, yeah, I, I hope to sell it, but I just want to look after these people. That's what I'm sort of sensitive to. And I don't want to be marketing that it's a Princess Margaret. I, I don't want to exploit that. So yes, it's about relationships yeah. and the responsibility I feel that goes along with it. Right. You know, it reminds me very much is like what you said, you know, your mom said about your ability to sell. I think that selling sometimes can have uh, a negative connotation by the word, but, but the way you're describing it, and it's almost a good way, and I'm cognizant of, of time, so I wanted yeah, to exactly. close it with this. And another comment is that it almost goes full circle because sales isn't a dirty word when you treat clients with respect and care and concern and empathy, and you're putting their best interest at the forefront of your mind. To me, if that's the definition of sales, I don't think that's a dirty word. I, I agree with you. you. Well, you know, and also with other like, agents, yeah. if, they, if they feel, and I take this from the fashion into the real estate, I'm sorry, I cut you off, Michael. Uh, no, no, go, to what your father said, two ears, one mouth. Um, if you think about, I don't want it to reflect poorly on me. I'm not going to put a woman in a dress that's ill-fitting or a man who looks like an imposter. The same thing. I don't want the blowback if I, I lead them down a, a, a dangerous path in real estate. So I, it's the same. Uh, even if you have to think selfishly, you want to make sure you, you CYA, cover your ass and make sure you do the right, you do right by the client. Right. And that's the guiding light. I think that's almost a perfect way to close out because that's the direction. That's the guiding light. That's, that's what we should follow as the needle on the compass is always putting our clients' needs at the forefront of our mind. And if we do that, nothing but good things can come from it. And they that's trust it. You I forever. that's exactly it. Trust. So Sarah, thank you. I know it, it took thank a lot you. of convincing to be here today, it but it made so uncomfortable. A world of but anyway, difference. thank you. <laughs> no, it's tremendous. You're amazing. And thank to you. me, what I remember most is being in that room and seeing how you established that wonderful friendship with a person who needed it at the time. That to me is what it's all about. And that's what you're all about. And thank you a million for being here today. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for having me at the Palace travels. team. It's such a great family. Oh, you're thank the you. best. Thank you, thank everybody. You. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah.